Chapter 37 Standing Alone Divine will in love is the centered vibration of higher self at our core, and the task of refining the base metals of personality into the radiant gold of spirit requires the conscious empowerment of will. As I've mentioned before, meditation and the spiritual path are like mountaineering. First you go up, then things are flat, then you go down. But we can also look at the spiritual path in another way. The higher you go, the smaller the crowd. While I don't think it's true universally, since so-called higher realms are filled with light beings, it does appear to be so on earth. The more effort we put into self-cultivation, the more time we spend in meditation, study, service, and reflection, the more we do tend to split off from the main body of society, which, to be honest, really has little interest in the disciplines of personality and the development of consciousness. Though spiritual dedication generates more compassion, desire to serve, and a sense of unity, it generally separates us, at least in awareness, from our peers. To boldly turn towards spirit, at least here in 3D, usually requires us to turn away from the world, at least for certain periods, and learn to stand alone. Again, it's important to differentiate Earth from the higher realms, where we find countless civilizations embracing spirituality, fully aware of universal path and design, hosting active temples of learning, prayer, and meditation, well integrated into the daily life of the whole society. We do have that to look forward to, and our society is definitely moving in that direction, in some sense. In the greater cosmos, there are numberless worlds dedicated to sending love and light to distant orbs, including our little planet Earth, where all souls are devoted to service, seeking greater unity with life. In these civilizations, one need not stand alone. In fact, their social harmony is so intense that it exerts a metaphysical force that unifies individual awareness into a greater collective mind. Their group actually becomes one being, a condition described by Ra in the Law of One as a social memory complex, unified knowing between all members of the group. According to many channeled sources as well as Ra, most of the wanderers on Earth are from just this type of society. No wonder we feel such alienation down here. The experience of individual and collective separateness is intense and very real in third dimension. Being naturally sensitive and open, wanderers often feel great pain within self-centered modern society. Beyond that, ET souls must also contend with the interdimensional dislocation of having lost the greater freedom and awareness native to higher realms. Some of the wanderers who have been here for centuries have developed a hard shell, often leading to bitterness. Many more of them have simply checked out from social engagement entirely, choosing to live more or less isolated. Whether or not you consider yourself an ET soul, you too may feel alienated from the common ways of the world. But in the world or out of it, we still must learn to stand alone. Despite, or perhaps because of global disharmony, the 3D schoolhouse Earth is an excellent training ground, not only for wanderers, but for all spiritual seekers who want to accelerate soul evolution. If you're familiar with the rigors of traditional Eastern paths, such as Zen Buddhism and Hindu Pranayama, you can appreciate the value of hard training and balanced discipline as catalyst for enlightenment. Seeking love and light and seeking to share that love and light in an environment of conflict and suffering can be a huge stimulus to awakening. As an example of this, I once lived in a Japanese Rinzai Zen Buddhist monastery in upstate New York, an austere and forbidding place called Daibosatsu Zendo, which translates as the Great Bodhisattva's Zen Training Temple. There, the teacher, or Roshi in Japanese, made liberal use of the famous wooden Zen stick called Keisaku. Far from being an instrument of torture, the Roshi explained that, quote, only the swift horses get a beating, and such a treat was reserved only for those students whose practice was already strong to further strengthen and intensify their work. We in the West, especially those familiar with New Age weekend workshops, are not accustomed to the real intensity of hard training in Oriental schools. The true adept path is a very serious matter, and when meditation practice connects to cosmic power and high-voltage energy rushes into the 3D body, it can literally be a matter of life or death. 
which I know from personal experience. Of my two closest friends and co-students there, one went temporarily insane and the other killed himself. Of course, we don't have to embark upon such a steep path to grow. Simply living in normal society can be a great catalyst to spiritual maturity. But it's neither easy nor simple. We can see all around us the results of not being able to get along in society. The mental institutions of all nations are full of those who could not cope, adapt, or stay centered within. In most cases, these souls were unable to clear their own personal process and deal with the outer challenges facing them. Though we are intensely social beings, learning how to stand alone is a central, core learning. For myself, as I suspect for all of us, life's course has involved gain and loss, grasping on and letting go. On the path of meditation, I've learned some of the skills of detachment from the body-mind system, and I've come to appreciate the basic impermanence and insubstantiality of thoughts and feelings. Realizing the illusory quality of one's own psychological process is the first step to really knowing emptiness or sunyata. Understanding the basic emptiness of thoughts and feelings does not mean denial, rejection, or judgment. It simply allows us to center ourselves in a more spacious awareness, which could be called a quality of spirit. From that vantage point, we're naturally less reactive to the passing play of mind. This can be called standing alone at the level of awareness, watching the shadows and clouds and not grasping on. In theosophy, it's called holding the mind steady in the light, quiet mind, being at ease in the light of soul. A second aspect of standing alone is much more literal. On my own path of growth, like so many other seekers around the world, I have had to detach myself from society in many ways. As I set priorities, some activities and acquaintances fell by the wayside. Some relationships had to end abruptly, while others took their place. Making a commitment to self-development, then gradually intensifying that commitment over time, always involves reshuffling the social deck. Since inner change radiates and magnetizes new contacts, as we grow, so too must our social circle. Since spiritual growth requires increasing inner contact, those who need other than what we offer will naturally drift away. Some phases of inner work demand outer withdrawal. And yet, while I've experienced much loss in social, material, and psychological terms, the vacuum has been filled from a deeper place. As in the saying, you can only receive with empty hands, there has been a corresponding influx of energy, meaning, purpose, and fulfillment over the years. Disillusionment led to a shattering of illusions. Detachment served to sever old bondage, and the loneliness of being alone opened up to an experience of greater wholeness and self-centering. The more you seek, the more you receive. The more you offer in service and spiritual balance, the more comes to you and through you. These ideas may seem trite, but they're also facts of life. Friends, co-workers, and true spiritual family will continue to come our way, possibly more than we ever imagined. Yet, while the community of heart may strengthen and its foundations grow more stable, there is still an abiding need for solitary work. Nothing is more transformative than communion between self and self, between conscious mind and our superconscious total being. Turning inward is the essence of all seeking and leads straight to will. As this turning inward finds its source, we'll also find the sacred within. Divine will in love is the centered vibration of higher self at our core, and the task of refining the base metals of personality into the radiant gold of spirit requires conscious empowerment of will in balance. As all esoteric schools tell us, the forces of will and endurance are developed through meditation, concentration, and focused service. Once developed, we also need will to safely stand alone. I recently met a woman who attends the school where I conducted the research for my first book, the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. Studying indigenous cultures, she also began to uncover her own distant roots, and a lot of starseed information about cosmic family soon came her way. While the school is somewhat broad-minded, how many places will accept a dissertation on ETs? Nevertheless, she still felt isolated, and moreover, her intellectual mind told her she must be crazy, unless 
She could separate fact from fantasy, inner truth from outer fear. She was unable to remain in such an environment. Clearly, there are stages to the process of self-understanding and the development of will. One of the first stages, which we can observe from this example, is learning how to trust one's own deeper knowing. Self-trust is the foundation for all inner growth, and it's also a prerequisite for standing alone. Yet there's no need to worry. You cannot ask for a better training camp than the planet you're living on right now. On Earth, it's not too easy to be clear, not too easy to be strong. It's not even easy to trust yourself, since you can always find a dissenting voice, either in your mind or out in society, which suggests you've made a mistake or that an opposite view is better. For a planet that's not yet in the light, while there is an apparent wall between the obvious and the eternal. Dealing with incessant duality and opposition is just the way things are. Here, uncertainty is the norm, and as Ra said, understanding is not of your density. Only through persistent and dedicated effort can we become clear enough to rise above the towers of social opinion, most of which happens to be confused. This kind of intellectual, intuitive self-reliance represents a more mental aspect of standing alone. If you are a wanderer, Remember, you didn't sign up for an easy job, nor did you come here on vacation. If you don't think you are a wanderer, then you don't have to worry about the cosmic details, but your path is still based on cosmic essentials, which include balance in self-acceptance, loving wisdom in service, and unity in fusion with true self. For all of us, the only guaranteed security that we can depend on and can take with us is found within. This notion is not pessimistic. And it's not a call to isolation. It just seems to be a fact of life here on Earth. Furthermore, the more sensitive you grow on the path of initiation, the more you will probably feel the prevailing confusion and distress around you. The common lot of 3D humanity on Earth. Even Ra was stymied by the complexity of human civilization, admitting that even they quote cannot plumb the depths of the distortions which infect your peoples. End quote. As our hearts open and our eyes clear to see and feel more of the real, widespread human distress becomes ever more apparent, sometimes painfully so. In my experience, the only escape is transformation, which is not really an escape at all, but rather transmutation, the development of new eyes and a new body with a new sense of self, and eventually no fixed sense of self at all. Like the tall, sun-bleached lighthouse high off the rocky main coast, standing alone at ease can be a beacon to those now tossed by storms of global change. Et wanderer or otherwise, we are all points of fiery light, expressing the one infinite light. And compassion, strength, and brilliance is our destiny. Even in solitude, we're not alone. In the next chapter. We will merge our study of Buddhism with a return to the development of body, mind, spirit. This time, we explore enlightenment from the perspective of a famous German author and his protege, Siddhartha, otherwise called the Buddha.